Welcome back, everyone, to Money and Markets. Many economists, along with the editors at Weiss Research, are raising red flags about the reemergence of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe and the possibility it will spread to the UK and even the United States. But so far, U.S. investors have ignored those warnings. To help us understand why, we're joined by two top money managers John Brown, senior market strategist at Euro Pacific Capital, and Sherman Goodrich, the vice president at Franklin Templeton Investments. First of all, I, I want to ask you both whether you agree that the sovereign debt crisis was not solved by the bailout of Greece and whether that was just swept under the rug. Sherman, let's start with you. Uh, not even close to being solved. I mean, it, you, you kind of put a Band-Aid on a very serious situation. I mean, you, you, you look at Greece, uh, their debt to GDP is more than 100%, and, and they really haven't practiced fiscal responsibility in a decade. So uh, this is, uh, you know, if they don't change some fundamental things, spending and things like that, this, uh, they'll need another Band-Aid real, real, real soon. So uh, it, it's still going to be a problem. John, a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, you agree? Yeah, oh, it was uh, definitely a Band-Aid. The question is, I think, first of all, Sherman's right. But in addition to that, the Band-Aid itself was pretty pathetic because it came up with several hundred billion dollars worth of only which 60 billion was actual cash. All the rest was guarantees and promises, not actual money. And even that uh, instigated or caused great political problems at home, particularly for the Germans. I mean, uh, Chancellor Merkel lost her majority in the, in the Berlin parliament. And uh, I think, you know, the Germans work hard for their money. They work very hard. And they were until recently, until they were just recently beaten by China, the largest exporter in the world. And it gave them wealth, but wealth that was hard-earned. And for them to have to start giving it away for people that retired at 50 and uh, had to lie to get into the European uh, currency, uh, they're not accepting that. And this is spreading throughout Europe. The undercurrent of having to bail these people out is shrinking. And yet the need for the bailout is rising because the whole thing was based on a falsehood. First of all, that one currency was good for all, and yet there was no single economy, no single government. And therefore, you had all these disparate economies, some of which was like B, were all rated AAA. But they, once their interest rate was dropped so they could borrow at AAA, they borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. And so they've landed the whole European Union in a huge debt crisis. And as you rightly said in your introduction, it's not just limited to Europe, because the euro is the second largest currency in the world, and the most widely held in cash terms in the world, even larger than the dollar. So if it went, it would create a huge problem. So the whole world is bound into it. Most central banks have diversified their cash reserves from the dollar into the euro and the dollar. So almost every central bank in the world holds large amounts of euros. So if the euro was to go, it would be catastrophic. And of course, it's spreading to other countries that have similar debt ratios to the ones that Sherman was highlighting for Greece, namely the United Kingdom and the United States. Okay, well, if things play out in the U.S., and Sherman, I think I want to ask you this, if they play out in the U.S. as, as we're talking about, what are the implications that we're going to see in the stock market? Well, I mean, it, it can't be good for the stock market in Europe, that's for sure. I mean, it, you know, Europe's got, you know, like John said, it, it is a very difficult position they're in. And their economic growth is, is slower. They're recovering slower than we are. Uh, Japan, same way. I mean, they're, they're another country that's got huge mountains of debt, slow economic growth. So this can't be good for their stock markets, uh, you know, over there in particular. I don't want to jump to the conclusion that it's coming here but I think you would agree with that philosophy, yes? Oh, I, I think it is, because what it actually, I think the sovereign debt crisis is, is a camouflage. It's a camouflage for a massive currency crisis. And that currency crisis is hinged to the U.S. dollar, which is the international reserve currency. And so you've got the largest, the most important currency in the world, the U.S. dollar, and you've got the largest, second largest currency and the largest in circulation, the euro, all in a massive crisis, aside from others. And so it's heading the world for a massive cr crisis in currency. And that is why, in my view, the prime reason that you're seeing gold rise in price when it should be falling in the face of deflation, which we're heading for. Uh, Sherman, what about the implications that you may see for treasuries and for the dollar? Well, <clears throat> treasuries, I mean, you know, we have a trillion and a half deficit. And uh, what we're going to run into a problem is being able to finance that deficit. I mean, our, our yields are so low, and if we keep this policy of low rates, 
uh, it's going to be difficult to finance that, uh, that budget deficit. So th that's going to be a problem. So uh, Treasury yields probably will have to rise down the road in order to uh, be able to, uh, people have interest in, in financing our deficit. Uh, so the dollar, um, you know, if we start to see Treasury yields go up, I think you could see the dollar appreciate, in particular against uh, the euro and the yen. Uh, because when you start to see Treasury yields moving up and the yield spreads gets wider and wider, and especially if, you know, we're doing a little better than those, uh, I think you could see the dollar go up against those two major currencies. I think, you know, I understand what Sherman's saying, but I just would add that the fact is once the interest rates start to rise, which I agree with Sherman they will, suddenly this huge interest rate risk that people are taking. If you invest in a treasury bill or a bond, long-term bond today, you're taking a massive interest rate risk. And the moment that huge bubble is pricked, I think you're going to see people not only run out of bonds, but I think many will run out of U.S. dollars. They'll just, this, they've seen the U.S. dollar as a refuge. Therefore, the way to invest in the U.S. dollar at a profit is to buy treasury bills or bonds. And once that starts to look like this huge bubble is going to burst, People are going to move out, not, I think, not just out of treasuries. Where else do they go? I think equities are going to look like a, a, a remains of a fire. Uh, so where do you go? You go to gold, and therefore you sell your dollars for gold. And I think there's going to be a, a tremendous pressure on the dollar, which is going to instigate the collapse of currencies. And I think what you're going to see, a possibility, is not only a devaluation of the U.S. dollar, as we had in 1934, a 75% devaluation of the dollar, but a renomination of the currency, which is what General de Gaulle did in France in the, in the 50s, and the Turkish Tur people have done recently, or both very successfully, mark you, of renominating the currency. Great if you are a debtor, but if you're a creditor, you're in real trouble. If you're owed money, you just get paid cents on the dollar. If you owe money, you make out like a bandit. And so I think that the, 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 will be end, end up as a solution, either a massive devaluation of the dollar or a renomination of the dollar, which is a more severe version. Sherman, a client comes to you. They say they want to protect their money. What advice do you give them? Well, I think a great way to, uh, to protect your money these days is in sovereign debt, but not in the four big nations, uh, Europe, Japan, Great Britain, and the U.S. Uh, I would have really no interest in being in those arenas. But again, I disagree a little bit in that I, as, you, as you look around the world, this is a very uneven recovery. Not every nation is loaded with debt. Uh, you have GDP growth going tremendous in countries like Brazil and India and China, Norway. Norway, at fiscal pot, they have a, just an oil fund that can pay their sovereign debt over four times. What if the oil goes away? Well, uh, that's not going to happen. We, I mean, oil is going to be there. But, I mean, that's just an example of a country that has practiced good fiscal responsibility. They're doing very well. Australia, I mean, Australia is raising interest rates. Uh, you know, Brazil has sovereign debt at, at 12% right now. And these are countries that right now, I would advise clients that they want to be in government bonds. I think these are perfect avenues to go to these days. John? Well, yes, Sherman's right. But of course, when a fight starts in a pub, it's the big boys that cause the trouble. There's some guys sitting gently drinking their beer at the corner. They don't, but the fight concentrates on the big fighters. And those are the currencies he's mentioned. I think as we're, in my view, facing acute deflation and a currency crisis, every conservative investor should be 100% liquid. I mean, 100%. And that means cash and precious metals. And the cash I would hold a very short term. If I was an American citizen and had dollar obligations, you've got to have dollars in the bank. So you hold those in very short term treasury bills. The rest in Swiss francs, that would be your cash. And gold and silver is your precious metals. For a more aggressive investor, I would start to go short of uh, US dollar, US uh, uh, equities, and US bonds. Okay, Sherman, your thoughts for more aggressive investors? Well, we're, uh, I would agree with short. Uh, shorting is a good way to, uh, for aggressive investors, but we would tend to disagree on shorting the dollar. We would tend to be shorting the euro right now and shorting the yen uh, because we have actually seen uh, a direct correlation with the yen and the U.S. dollar when treasury rates move up in the U.S. Yen gets, yen gets hit really hard. And uh, so we, we, we've been short those currencies these days and uh, don't really plan on changing that strategy at this point in time. All in right. the short term, I would agree with, with Sherman because there's been a huge dollar carry trade. People have borrowed 
dollars at very low interest rates and have converted it into euros and other currencies to invest in real estate and various things around the world. When uh, dollar rates start to rise, they will start to, and, and other places start to collapse, they'll want to undo that loan. So they'll sell the currency they got into to buy US dollars to pay back their loan. Therefore, I think in the short term, before this currency collapse happens, you will see a rise in US dollars, but you've got to be very, very nifty to get in and out. Right. And then you've got to wait for the big shift, because I then see, after this, a government's panic. And when they panic, they're just going to spew money at everything they can see, and that's when the hyperinflation takes off and investors have to suddenly switch from cash into assets. All right, gentlemen, that's all the time we have now. John Brown, thank you, sir, for being here. And Sherman Goodrich, thanks so thank much. You. Also, thanks to Klaus Vogt, Brian Rich, and Jen Amos. If you have a question for any of this week's guests or a suggestion for a topic that you'd like us to cover, just email us at weissmoneynetwork at weissinc.com. Coming up next week, we're going to take a closer look at interest rates, which have remained at historic lows all over the world. Is it the right strategy to boost the global economy? And how can you take advantage of that trend? Tune in next week to find out. That's it for this edition of Money and Markets. I'm Jamie Holmes. And now, in for Martin Weiss, here's Mike Larson. Thanks, Jamie. The debt crisis we've been talking about this week poses a grave threat to sovereign governments. That much is a given. But make no mistake, the European Union didn't spend 110 billion euros to bail out Greece. It was protecting the banks that held Greek debt. If Greece has been allowed to default, several major European financial institutions would likely have collapsed as well. And that was the outcome the EU couldn't abide. So in thinking about this next wave of the sovereign debt crisis, I think it's instructive to look at the banks. And that's where it gets really scary. Europe conducted stress tests on the banks back in July, and they came out smelling like roses. That's really no surprise, because the tests weren't nearly stressful enough. The whole exercise reminded me a lot of the tests our own banks went through in the wake of the credit crisis a couple years ago. In that case, both the results and the underlying problem with the tests themselves were exactly the same. But this time, the consequences could be much more dire. During the last credit crisis, we were worried about private credit risk. This time, it's not individual mortgage or credit card borrowers that are sliding towards default. It's entire countries. And here's another difference. During the U.S. stress tests, governments could borrow and spend all they wanted in order to bail out failing institutions. Now the bond vigilantes are putting their feet down. They're forcing countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, and the U.K. to stop throwing money at struggling institutions. So disregard any of this happy talk coming out of Europe. The U.S. banks came out of their stress tests looking fine when they were most definitely were not fine. This is a clear case of fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. I'd also distance yourself from any financial institutions with exposure to European debt. In fact, I'm recommending you stay away from any banks and raise cash instead. Another global recession is increasingly likely, and with it, the possibility of major defaults. I wish we could paint a prettier picture. What we can do, however, is give you the knowledge and tools to protect yourself. I'm Mike Larson. Thanks for watching Money and Markets.